Good morning. All right, let me, let me just say a couple things before we get started. Um, I'm loud and sassy, all right? But uh, Derek's loud and sassy too, so y'all are used to that, right? Uh, I will tell you, this will ho- go a whole lot better for all of us if you'll talk to me. Uh, where's Tina? Okay, girl. All right, I at least know you're going to talk to me, and if you don't, I'm going to call you out, all right? Um, here's the deal. I'm going to preach till I'm sure you got it. So the quicker you say I got it, the faster we will move on. Aren't we done now? <laughs> okay. Now, man, I'm so glad to be with you guys today and uh, to share in this uh, sermon series on the life of David, uh, where you are considering what you can learn from him, from the life of David, through the Psalms about experiencing and responding to God in the midst, in the middle of our everyday human condition. But I've got to be a little bit honest with you and tell you that I have a sort of a love-hate relationship with these pastors who ask me to come preach at their church and then give me a text and tell me what it's about and tell me to preach that. Um, it kind of goes like this. Uh, I'd love for you to come preach, but here's what you got to preach. Um, I, I hate it for a lot of reasons. Well, mostly just for one, I like to be in charge I like to decide. I want to preach what I want to preach. Don't be giving me a text and a title because I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. It's like, uh, but on the other hand, I got to tell you, I I love it. Because every time God speaks to me, it's like these young preacher boys get a word from the Spirit. Tell Gaynor to preach this. I need to talk to him about some stuff. And over and over again, the preaching assignment uh, brings me face to face with some truth that I need to hear. And this time is no different. So I don't know whether this is a word for y'all or not, but it's a word for me this morning. And as I preach to you, rest assured I am preaching to myself from the Word of God. So you ready? Let's go. Psalm 63. We're going to walk through this psalm and consider what does it teach us about experiencing God when we are lacking. On the surface, as Pastor Derek read the the psalm, it really doesn't sound like David's lacking a whole lot. It actually sounds very positive. Honestly, until you get to the last couple of verses, it doesn't sound like his situation is all that bad. Until you go to somebody trying to kill you and people lying about you, I feel like you're doing all right. But the description, the superscription just below Psalm 63 tells us that David was in a tough spot when he penned this psalm. Here's what it says. A psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. Most scholars agree that this circumstance points to a particular time in David's life when he was on the run. And I'm going to tell you, the background of this psalm sounds like the script to a soap opera. Do y'all even know what soap operas are? (laughs) All right, I figured you might be too young. How about just a raunchy talk show? Here it goes. Here's how it goes. David has a son named Amnon who falls in love, or maybe we should say in lust, with his stepsister Tamar. His obsession only grows until he devises a plan, shall we say, to take advantage of her. He fakes being sick and he asks his dad, King David, to let her come over and make him some chicken soup. When she comes over, when she arrives, he sends all of the servants out of the house and he makes his move. Tamar protests. He rapes her. Then he decides that he hates her and sends her away. When her brother Absalom finds out what's happened, he starts plotting and planning his revenge. Two years later, he kills Amnon. Then he flees. King David grieves because, in essence, he's lost two sons. But he never holds Absalom accountable. 
And a few years later, Absalom returns, but David just sweeps the past transgressions under the rug. Again, there's no accountability. There's no confrontation. There's no reconciliation. He just lets it go. Meanwhile, Absalom, who's very good looking and very winsome, sets out to build a following of his own. Eventually, he mounts a coup and ousts his dad. So David flees and heads for the desert with Absalom in pursuit, plotting to kill him. In fact, the end of the psalm tells us not only that David is threatened and lied about, tells us that he's in a very dry and weary place. I told you it was messed up. I told you it was raunchy. By the way, how's that compared to your family drama? Might make some of you feel better. Clearly, David's not in a place of abundance when he writes this psalm, but, but rather he's feeling the poverty of his circumstance. But I got to tell you what struck me as I walked through this psalm was how little is said about David's circumstance. The prevailing focus of the psalm is not his personal condition. The prevailing focus of this psalm is the character and sufficiency of God himself. And that right there tells us exactly what we need to know. What do you do? How do you respond when you're lacking? You ready? You worship your way to satisfaction. You worship your way to satisfaction. That's what David did. He didn't highlight his heartache. He didn't recount his trouble or bemoan his disappointment. He didn't fret about his future. He set his heart and his mind on God. He worshiped his way into satisfaction in the abundance of God. He feasted on God when he was famished by life. That's what you do, brothers and sisters. When you're lacking, you worship your way to satisfaction. Let's walk through the psalm and see just how David did that. The first thing that I see that David did was he defined his desire. He defined his desire. Look at verses 1 and 2. Oh God, you're my God. Earnestly I seek for you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and parched land where there's no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Listen, David, of all people, has enjoyed great success and prosperity. He's been in the place of abundance. He's had the position of highest authority. He's handled great responsibility. He's experienced immense blessing and pleasure, but he does not set his heart on those things. Listen to it again. David's longing was for God. What does he say? Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. In another season in David's life, when he was surrounded by trouble and under attack, he penned these words in Psalm 27, 4. One thing I ask of the Lord. And this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Y'all, I don't know about you, but in seasons of trouble, I'm not that single-minded. If I am, it's not to be with God, it's to get out of trouble. Because often I'm convinced that what I need most of all is what God can do for me, but what I really need is who God is. David had an unquenchable thirst. He had an insatiable appetite for God because he had tasted and he had seen that God was good. He wanted more of God. You see, David had spent time with God, communing with God, listening to him, learning to know him and to delight in him. And that experience of God fanned into flame his desire for more of God. More than he loved the idea of pleasant circumstances, David loved and longed for God. For some of you, the problem isn't is that you just don't know God that way. 
Because you haven't prioritized spending time with him, learning him, knowing in him, delighting in him. I read this quote a couple of years ago from John Piper and it pierced my own heart. He said, you can't savor what you don't see. You can't cherish and desire and love and enjoy and treasure what you're not aware of. If we don't desire and cherish and enjoy and savor and treasure Christ, we'll not commend him as magnificent in what we feel and say and do. Christ is most magnified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And we cannot be satisfied daily in the depths of our soul in Christ if we don't see and savor him. My point, Piper says, is that that can only happen by a steady meditation on the Word of God in the Bible. You want to see and savor Christ? Then you read the Word of God looking for Him. You pull away from the things of the world and you center your mind and heart on the truths of God. You let God speak to you and reveal His character for, to you and show you what He's like. Can I tell you this? You long for what you love. You long for what you love. You chase what you love. You dream about what you love. And if you want to stir up longing for God, then you've got to stir up love for God. And you can't do that until you learn to look for God. you got to get to know him by spending time in his word. But i, I got to be honest today. Some of you aren't hungry for God. You don't run to him for satisfaction because you're still trying to satisfy yourself with other things. I got a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old boy. Boys, two boys, 13 and 15. And their appetite amazes me. Uh, We go through, I I I can't tell you how many boxes of cereal and gallons of milk uh, every week. And the first place my boys go when they get home in the afternoon is to the pantry. And they're standing there in the doorway and they're gazing on all the junk and the snack food and the protein bars and the cereal and the Pop-Tarts and the chips. And what do I always have to say to them? Don't fill up on that. You're going to, you're going to spoil your appetite. You're going to ruin your dinner. And my 13-year-old is often the greatest transgressor in this department. Because he's like, I'm not going to eat that much. And then we get to the dinner table and plate his food, and he's like, I'm not hungry. He's not hungry for the things that would nourish him and bring strength and vitality to him because he's filled himself with junk food. Can I just say to you that spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, this is what many of you are doing. You're not hungry for God because you're feasting on the junk of the world. You've got no appetite for God. For some of you, what you're chasing after, what you're feasting on is straight up sin. And sin will kill your appetite for God like nothing else. But for some of you, the thing you've set your heart on is not in itself a bad thing. But a good thing becomes a bad thing when we make it a God thing. This is the condemnation God spoke to his people in Jeremiah 2.13. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Listen, I need to tell you anything other than God will never satisfy you. It'll always fall short. It's always temporary. No relationship. No, no measure of success, no good deeds, no nice family, no nice house, no level of income will ever satisfy you because it never lasts. It never endures. The only enduring thing that will satisfy you is Jesus. That's why he said to the woman at the well, the people who drink of this water are going to thirst again. But when you drink of the water I give, you'll never thirst again. In seasons of lack, y'all, we got to remember that what we're really longing for is God himself. What we need is him, not what he can do for us. So we got to learn to define our desire. The second thing David did is this. He celebrated the love of God. 
He celebrated the love of God. Look at verses three and four. He said, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name, I will lift up my hands. Your love is better than life. What does that mean? What's David saying? He's saying that to be loved by God is better than the best thing life has to offer. Listen, my brothers and sisters, the very best dream you can have of this life does not even compare to the sweetness of the love of God. But our problem is that we think a lot about the best things this life has to offer, and we imagine how satisfying and fulfilling those things would be, but spend little time contemplating the greatness of God's love for us. Let me ask you this morning, what are you dreaming about? What are you thinking about? What, 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 are, what are you fantasizing about? What are you believing today would bring you satisfaction and joy? If the love of God is not at the top of that list, then you don't understand what it means to be loved by God. You haven't experienced this kind of love that God has lavished on you that you should be called the children of God. Well, you may say, how did David know that? How how am I supposed to know that? I'm going to tell you, David had three things on which he could anchor his confidence in the love of God. The first was the Word of God. David didn't have the multitude of the Scriptures that we have, but he had the Word of God that told the story of God's love for his people. He had the Word of God that described for David what it meant to live in the love of God. David also had the testimony of the people of God. He had the stories of the children of Israel that described how God had loved them and shepherded them and cared for them and brought them out and into the land of abundance. And David had his own experience. He had his own experience of of knowing in his heart the love of God. And can I just tell you, brothers and sisters, you and I have the same three things. We have the Word of God that describes for us and unpacks for us God's incredibly great love for us. We have the testimony of the saints around us who can tell us of how they've experienced the love of God. And we have our own experience. Have you tasted and seen and known the love of God? Listen, if we're going to walk faithfully, through seasons when we experience lack, particularly when we are lacking the best things of life, then we're going to have to be convinced that being loved by God makes up for that lack. Derek mentioned this. Uh, might be helpful for some of you to know that I did not get married until I was 47. So I spent 20 years in ministry as a single man and then can I just tell you that, that, that many times I found myself longing for marriage because I was imagining the benefit and the satisfaction that would come from being married. And I want you to know that marriage is a beautiful thing and it's a wonderful thing. And it's a good thing and it's a gift from God, but it's not all satisfying. It's not enough to satisfy the longing of my heart because my wife's love for me and my love for her are both imperfect. But God's great love for us is perfect and all satisfying. And I'm gonna tell you, in whatever season you're in, you're going to have to learn to be satisfied with the love of God for you. So that when you start looking for love from another person and they don't give it, you're not devastated because you know what it is to be loved and accepted in Christ. Y'all, I think that may be a part of why the Apostle Paul prayed the way he did for the Ephesians church. You know what he said in 3.18, Ephesians 3.18? And I pray that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how long and wide and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses the surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to the measure of all the fullness of God. You know what what strikes me about that? Is that it takes power, it takes strength, it takes Holy Spirit work in me for me to grasp and hang on to and know and believe the love of God for me. Let me ask you this. Do you struggle to believe that God loves you? 
Do you struggle to believe that God loves you? Does the lie of the enemy rise up in you? He doesn't really love you. If he loved you, this wouldn't be happening to you. If he loved you, he would have done that or he wouldn't have done this. Is it because your current circumstances or is it because of something in the past? Listen to me. Your circumstances are never the measure of God's love for you. Listen, your circumstances are never the measure of God's love for you. I thought about this this morning as I was walking back through this. If that were the case, if God, if my circumstances, if our circumstances were the measure of God's love for us, then Jesus could have concluded at several different points in his life that God did not love him. Yeah. Dang. Jesus' Jesus' confidence in God's love for him was not wrecked because he was rejected. It was not wrecked because he lacked a place to lay his head. It did not lack, it did not suffer. He was not devastated in his understanding of God's love because he was crucified. He was confident in God's love for him. And listen to me, you and I can have that same kind of confidence. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know what I love about that verse? It does not say God demonstrated his love for us. It says he demonstrates. God's current demonstration of his love for you is not your circumstance. It's this, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Listen to me. You, you want to know and believe the love of God for you? You want, to, you want to anchor yourself to the truth that God loves you? Then you need to get into the word of God and you need to memorize some verses that tell you of God's great love for you. Otherwise, when you come to, to difficult circumstances, all you've got is your own thoughts, feelings, and opinions. And I just need to tell you that that'll never be enough to wage war with the lies of the enemy. Because he's out to convince you that you're not loved. He's out to separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. But thank God Romans 8 says nothing. Nothing will be able to separate separate us from the love of God in Christ. Listen, we got to learn to know and believe and celebrate God's great, great love for us. So that in seasons of want, we don't believe the lie that God doesn't love us and he is not love. All right? So, so we, we've got to define our desire. We've got to celebrate the love of God. The third thing that David did was he meditated on the goodness of God. He meditated on the goodness of God. Look at verses five and six. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Let me remind you that when David penned those words, his situation hadn't changed. Nothing about his current circumstance had been uh, improved, and yet he's anticipating satisfaction. What's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying, by faith, I'm going to imagine myself being fully satisfied with Jesus. I'm currently in a, um, a season, uh, along with many in our church, of fasting and prayer. I'm on day uh, 14 of our 21 days of fasting and prayer. And um, I, I, the first thought I had this morning was, when, when you were standing there, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm getting a little lightheaded. I, I hope I don't pass out while I'm preaching. <laughs> That'd be like disrupting. <laughs> um, but here's what I can tell you. Um, I'm, I'm not, just, just to clarify, I'm not, I'm not fasting 24 hours a day, all 21 days. I'm, I'm fasting every day and breaking the fast at dinner. But here's what I can tell you. Uh, there are moments in the day where I imagine myself being satisfied with what I'm going to eat at dinner time. I'm anticipating it. I'm thinking about it. Now, now, the purpose of fasting, what I'm experiencing in fasting, one of the things that I'm very well aware of is how fixated my mind can be on food. And, I, and, and, I, and, and I'm looking forward to that, and I'm anticipating. The other thing I'm learning is how obedient I am to my flesh. And I have to ask myself, when I start to feel those hunger pains, and I want so desperately to grab something to eat and, and, and 
and uh, satisfy the hunger of my body. I have to ask myself, why am I not that aware of my hunger for God? And why am I not that obedient to the urge of the Spirit? You see, listen, you and I have to learn to anticipate and expect that Jesus is going to be satisfying. That's what David's doing. He's anticipating satisfaction. He's dreaming about the feast. And he, when, he, when he lies awake at night, you see where it says, On my bed I remember you, I think of you through the watches of the night. David's saying when he lies awake at night, he's recalling and recounting the goodness and glory of God, not contemplating trouble. He's feeding faith and hope, not nursing anxiety and fear. Let me ask you that. Is, is that what you do? Way too many of us, way too many of us lie awake at night nursing anxiety and fear, not feeding faith and hope. But David says, no, I'm going to be satisfied. You're going to satisfy me. I know it. I've tasted it. I've seen that you're good. And I can believe that you're going to satisfy me. And so I'm going to wait. And I'm going to hope. And I'm going to sing. And I'm going to think of you. Listen to me. Negative rumination will kill your faith. Negative rumination will kill your faith. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Negative rumination is when you and I sit in something and spiral down to the point that we begin to imagine a future that is void of the presence and activity of God. Negative rumination, imagining the worst factoring God out, not giving space and room and faith to believe that God, God is in you and he is in this and he is working all things together for your good and his glory. And by the way, don't, when, you, when you quote that verse, don't stop at the end of 28 because 29 says, for those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You need to know that your idea of what, what is good and God's idea might be grossly different. Because sometimes all I'm looking for is peace and safety and security and abundance and pleasure And God is working through the circumstances of my life to shape and mold me into the image of Christ, to draw me to himself. Negative rumination will kill your faith. Listen to me. In Christ, your future is secure. God has made too many promises for us to believe the enemy's lies. At uh, my home church, we are fond of quoting Ephesians 3.20. Now to him, you know this verse, who's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church through Christ Jesus both now and for. To him who's able to do more than I can imagine. You know what we think about that verse often? What we think is I got my little dream and God just supersizes my dream. He just puts an exponent out there and my dream just gets bigger and better. That's not what the verse says. The verse says that, the listen, God can do more and better because he can dream more and better. God's ideas about what is good for you are way better than your ideas of what's good for you. And God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And listen, church, we got we to gotta learn to begin to love the dreams that God has for us to embrace those and to imagine that he will satisfy and fulfill all that he's promised. Let me ask you this question. What what do you know of the goodness of God? What do you know? What have you experienced? What have you seen? What have you read? you got to begin to rehearse that. The scripture says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Y'all, we got to begin to repeat those things, to talk about those things, to say those things to ourselves. Stop rehearsing for yourself the worst case scenario. And rehearse the promises and the goodness of God. That's why, that's why David, or the psalmist would say in Psalm 16 too, I said to the Lord, you're my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. 
Nothing's good separated from you. I've been thinking about this verse where uh, Jesus said, if a, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I want you to think about it just a, good th- just a second. Let me, let me distill that. What profit is it if you get everything and don't have Jesus? Okay, well, let me ask you this. If there's no profit margin when you got everything and you don't have Jesus, what profit is if you get this one little thing you want so bad and you don't have Jesus? Do you understand what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense. Y'all, what you need is not what God can give or what God can do. What you need, what your soul longs for, the goodness of God is found in him. The scripture does not say God does good. It says he is good. And you and I need to press in to know him. All right, so we got to define our desire. We got to celebrate the love of God. We got to meditate on the goodness of God. The fourth thing David did is this he recalled the faithfulness of God. He recalled the faithfulness of God. Look at verses seven and eight. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. All right, I love this. Look at the way these verses are structured. Let me read it again. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. What you have in the middle is singing and clinging. But these phrases are bookended by the faithfulness of God. Because you are my help, your right hand upholds me. Listen, David's response to God is motivated by his recollection of God's faithfulness to him. He's singing about the help of God in the past, and he's clinging to the hand that's been holding on to him. Y'all, an essential part of our worship is recalling the faithfulness of God. We need to repeat it for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters who are around us. Lord, that's why, that's why you need to stand in this place and sing with a full heart. Lord, you are good and your mercies endure forever. It's why you need to talk to each other about the faithfulness of God to meet you, to speak to you, to provide for you, to supply you, to sustain you, to hold you up. You need to talk about it because listen to me, somebody seated next to you is wondering today if they can trust the faithfulness of God. And how are they going to know that unless you testify to it? Y'all, we've got... We've got to repeat the faithfulness of God for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters. Listen, David may have been lacking. He was wanting and hurting, but he did not despair because he remembered the faithfulness of God. Listen to me. The past faithfulness of God is a promise of the future faithfulness of God. Because the scripture tells me he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God was faithful in the past, if he was faithful not just to me in the past, if he was faithful to the people of God in the past, if he was faithful to the children of Israel, if he was faithful to his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I can believe that God will be faithful to me because he doesn't change. And so we got to stir up hope and joy in the middle of unpleasant circumstances because God is faithful. I don't know if y'all sing this song here. We sing it at home. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Why? Because death is defeated and the king is alive. Listen, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, his power is at work in me, and I can believe that he's going to finish what he started. Y'all, I hang on to promises like Philippians 1.9, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to carry it on to completion. He ain't going to stop. He's not going to give up. He's not going to run out of resources or supply. He's going to finish what he started. He's faithful to do that kind of thing. 
Last January, I memorized this verse, Jude 1, 24, and I can't tell you how much I've needed it the last 12 months. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling and present you before his glorious presence, faultless and with great joy. Listen, I'm not going to fall apart because he's not going to let me. He's going to keep me from stumbling. And one day, he's going to present me before his glorious presence, faultless, faultless, pure, holy, righteous. And there's going to be a whole lot of joy about that. He's going to be happy about it. I'm going to be happy about it. And everybody who's ever had to deal with me is going to be happy about it. Y'all, we got to stir up confidence in the faithfulness of God. Not one of his promises has failed. And you got to call it out. You got to talk about it. You got to stoke the fire of faith. Listen, uh, you tell the history of the children of Israel. You read it in the Old Testament and over and over and over and over again, it says this, the children of Israel turned from God. Why did they turn from God? Because they forgot. They forgot. They forgot the faithfulness and goodness of God. Now, let me ask you this question. How is it that you stand on the edge of a sea. And coming behind you is an army with horses and chariots and spears and javelins. And just before they get there, the cloud that has been in front of you moves to the back to obscure obscure their view. And then the sea opens up and you walk across on not mushy ground, but dry ground. And then when you get to the other side, the cloud comes up The enemy comes in and the sea engulfs them. How do you forget that? You want me to tell you? The same way you've forgotten the multitude of times that God's been faithful to you. You see, we think that forgetting is passive. What do we say? Oh, oh, I forgot. I forgot. It just, I just forgot. Forgetting is not passive. Forgetting is the result of not actively remembering. You want to remember the faithfulness of God? You don't want to forget it? Then you got to talk about it. You got to write it down. You got to keep a record of it. You got to keep coming back to it. Listen to me. There's no past faithfulness of God in your life that is irrelevant for today. Not a single solitary time that God has come through for you is it worth forgetting. You need to be building an Ebenezer like they did when they came across the Jordan. Here I raise mine Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Y'all, I trust in the faithfulness of God because behind me is a trail of it. And you and I have to be actively remembering the faithfulness of God. All right? All right, so what did he do? He defined his desire. He celebrated the love of God. He meditated on the goodness of God. He recalled the faithfulness of God. And finally... Verses 9 through 11 tell us he set his hope on the sovereign purposes of God. Look at verse 9. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the, soul, of the earth. They'll be given over to the sword and become food for jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God will praise him. While the mouths of liars will be silenced. David was confident that God's purposes and God's plans for him could not fail. Listen to what he's saying. God will not be defeated. My enemies will not be triumphant. Those who are trying to destroy me will themselves be destroyed. The praise of God will not cease, but the liars will be silenced. Now look at me just a second. Honestly, y'all, I don't know if David was thinking short-term or long-term. I don't know if he thought that this would be fulfilled in his lifetime or just in eternity. But it matters that you and I believe in the purposes and promises of God both now and for eternity. Psalm 33.10, the Lord foils the plans 
of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the, the, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Y'all, I go back to those verses time and time again because I need to remind myself, God ain't losing this battle. It's not over. It's not, it, it's not, not over when, until the fat lady sings. It's not over until Jesus says it's over, until he says it's finished, and he did, until he declares his work complete. Listen, David trusted in the sovereign purposes of God. And I have to learn to do the same. And while all the promises of God are, according to 2 Corinthians 1.20, yes and amen, they are not all right now. I need to say that again. All of his promises are yes and amen, but they're not all right now. 1 Corinthians 15.19, if we only for this life have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be most pitied. Y'all, if you don't have a hope in the purposes of God that extend beyond your lifetime, you're to be pitied. Because if the best we can hope for is a good life here, then you better throw off the restraints of the Word of God and go live like the world and get all the gusto you can get. But if, if the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus for all of eternity, then I surrender myself to him and I walk with him and I trust him and I believe that he is going to do me good. Listen, just like David, there is one who's seeking our destruction. David had an enemy and so do we. The Bible says he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's come to steal and kill and destroy. But we can be confident he will not succeed. Because Jesus already won the victory. And one day, Satan himself will receive his final judgment and condemnation. And like David, we can be confident that it is the praises of God that will endure and not the lies of the enemy. But y'all, you got to lift up your head and look. you got to look down the road. You've got to anticipate and expect that the God who's been faithful in the past will be faithful in the future. And you can, he can be trusted. He can be trusted. His purposes and his plans are for our good. I love Jeremiah 29. This is another one of those verses. Don't learn, don't learn one verse. Learn the rest of it. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord. Plans, oh, we love this. Oh, God, we love this. Prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Oh, yes, Jesus, I want that. We love that verse. Our problem is the way we dis define those words, prosper, not harm, hope, and the future. Because you see, verse 12 is very important. It says, then you will come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Listen, God has envisioned a future for you that is not separated from his presence. You know what, what, you know what real prospering is? You know what real joy is? You know what real pleasure is? Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Listen, the, prompt, the things you can experience here, they're all temporary. They're all fleeting. They're all going to, none of them going to last. But what God's promised for you will endure forever, for all generations. If, like David, you and I are going to grow to be men, men and women after God's own heart, if we're going to be men and women who are after the heart of God, then we're going to have to learn to worship our way to contentment. Whether you're in a season of lack or not, you still need to set your heart and hope on Jesus. Because you can be sure of this, no other abundance this side of heaven is going to last. It's all temporary. Only Jesus is eternal. And when you and I set our hope on him, other disappointments won't derail us. When we focus our minds and hearts on God, we can feast on him even in the middle of famine. I want to say this to you. Some of you are in a hard place today. There's some bitter disappointment. There's some hardship. There's some pain. 
might be shame. There's some trouble and difficulty. And for some of you, just getting out of the bed in the morning is so incredibly hard. And you ask yourself, God could do something about this. Why doesn't he do something? I want to suggest to you that maybe God has put you on your back so you will look up and see him. Because more than you need escape or relief, you need the all-satisfying goodness of Jesus Christ. You think God is withholding from you. I think God is holding out his hand to you. So how do you do? How do you worship? When you're lacking, you define your desire for God. You celebrate the love of God. You meditate on the goodness of God. You recall the faithfulness of God. And you set your hope on the sovereign of God. Can we pray together? God, I'm going to confess that all of this sounds really good. But I know I can't do this apart from you. God, I I can't. I can't do these things. I, I honestly cannot worship you apart from your Holy Spirit stirring in me and drawing me and helping me. God, I don't want to stand at a distance and demand something from you. I want to look you square in the eye and be able to say what David said. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land. I've seen your power and your glory Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will glorify you. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. God, I want to be like that. But I can't work my way into that. I can't do that for myself, God. I need you by the power of the Holy Spirit to work in me so that even in the middle of lack and want and disappointment and heartache, I'm still worshiping Jesus. God, help us today, we pray in his name. Amen.